our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Well, here we are. Sorry we're a little bit late. We uh, had some technical issues, but better late than ever. In fact, Susan and I flew back from Costa Rica at 4 a.m. this morning specifically so I could interview my present guest. There was a lot of excitement on Restream and those of you that are on the Clubhouse. I'm not sure if we're going to take questions today. We'll see how this goes, but uh, do listen there. And, of course, if you do take questions, you'll be up on the Restream on Twitch, Twitter, we on Rumble today too, Susan? Yes. Uh, Facebook, you, everywhere. Everywhere you can be seen, you will be seen. Arriba, arriba, andale, yes, andale. Yes, Dr. Antoni, Antonio Damasio, um, probably the leading voice in neuroscience uh, in the world. He has seminal contributions to the understanding of brain processes. His books, many of which are for uh, general consumption, include uh, Descartes' Air, which was really his sort of breakout book, I think. Self Comes to Mind, Looking for Spinoza, Feeling of What Happens. And the latest book is Feeling and Knowing. Dr. Damasio is the university professor of psychology, philosophy, and neurology, and the David Dornsife chair in neuroscience, as well as professor of psychology, philosophy, and neurology at the University of Southern California, and uh, adjunct professor at the Salk Institute. In addition to being a physician, he is a research scientist. Uh, Dr. Damasio, welcome to the program. My pleasure to be here. So uh, I've got so much I want to talk to you about today. Uh, are you are you feeling okay? This is a conversation about feeling. I know this has been frustration and desperation getting you to this point. Are you okay? Well, I'm I'm trying to feel okay, but we had quite <laughs> a lot of problem with the connection, so it's not exactly the most auspicious way to to start. But I know that you're gonna you're gonna make it worth my desperation. That's right. We're gonna make it worth your time and desperation. It, it looks good and it sounds good, and that's what counts here. Uh, by the way, was that your? I, I don't know if you remember, but I, I, I sat with you one afternoon. I got a, a chance to meet your wife, who I think I saw lurking around behind you, probably the one solving these technical problems. She was trying to solve the technical problems along with your people, and uh, and without her, I would not have been able to do it. Well, which let is you jump ahead. Well, <laughs> I, I have the exact same relationship with my wife, which is uh, yes, he does fairly helpless. Let, let me jump ahead to her research and we'll kind of, we're going to, I'm going to want to jump around a little bit. And this may, this, my interview sort of style may not be, I've heard you on some other uh, podcasts and interview shows. And I, I thought, I, I, I'm just going to go with what interests me because there's so many things in your new book that do interest me. Um, one of the you're things talking you were talking <laughs> well, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, I learned from your wife and you too, that uh, a major component of the dissolution of the self associated with Alzheimer's disease is the dissolution of the posterior or the destruction of the posterior parietal lobes. Did I get that correct? Or that region, the sort of what used to be called the transitional areas? Uh, yes, you, you got it right. And that's that's an interesting way to, to, to start. I wouldn't have not have started there, but here's here's the, the, the fact. That's true. Um, and it helps me to say something I think very important. When you when you have damage in some of the higher cortices, uh, especially parietal cortices for sure, uh, when you have damage there, you actually have a major insult to mind processes, to those processes where we put together images. Uh, can be images from the visual system, uh, images images of things that we see and hear and touch or, or even smell, um, but they're images of the things that are in the world that surround us. Curiously, that same kind of damage does not destroy or does not compromise images that correspond to the interior of our bodies, to the interior of our living bodies. Which really means that they're not—they don't impinge on feeling as much as they impinge on 
the outside world, and they end up being more of a problem for uh, for how we construct the mind, either from what we see or from what we remember, um, then creating a problem for consciousness itself. So it's, it's, a, it's very complicated because you literally started at the top. If you damage higher cortices, the higher parts of the cerebral cortex, you damage primarily structures that are in charge of creating images, of creating the flow of our minds, is a sort of the, the, the stream of our minds. Um, but you don't necessarily damage the part, the, the kind of images that correspond to life inside the body, which really means that you don't compromise that much feeling and you end up not compromising consciousness, which really means that I'm already okay. telling you that if you want to understand consciousness, don't start at the top. Don't start by the large picture of our mind stream. Start instead by the lower uh, components, by what has to do with our body from the interior on out. It's actually the, the, the reverse trajectory. Um, but well, if you learn that let's about... Continue. Let's, let's, let's continue. Let's yeah, continue in that ahead. reverse trajectory. So what you put, what you put beneath is something, an extraordinary complex, which... See, I, the reason I brought this up, I thought that looked like what your wife was doing when I was visiting you guys, which was the mm -hmm. interconnectivity around, around the so-called affect complex. The regions, the, the nuclei, the regions, and, and the processing that's going on that's affect complex, and whether or not that is simultaneously al alive, so to speak, at the same time as the parietal cortices, or is there communication, or both, between the parietal cortices and the affect complex, the, the, there is plenty of communication. But what is what is interesting? Because I know that you're interested in consciousness, obviously, and you're interested in feeling also. So what what is because feeling is in fact the 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 main component of what we normally call affect. It includes other things such as emotions, but the main com component is feeling. So what is interesting is that the kinds of damage to the nervous system that compromise feeling actually happen more at the level of the brain stem and even at the level of the spinal cord than they happen at the level of the cortex. One thing we know for sure is that you can have extensive regions of the cerebral cortex literally disappear as when you have a large stroke or you have a surgical ablation and still you preserve feeling which is very interesting. On the other hand, we know that if you have even a small stroke in a strategic area of the brainstem, you can produce coma, and that coma will obliterate consciousness sometimes forever, and you'd have no, you have very, it's very difficult to recover from it. So there's a very strange uh, um, uh, misalignment here. You have something which is vital to generate consciousness, which is feeling, that depends on this beautiful conversation between the nervous system on the one hand and our living body on the other. And that depends on structures that are somewhat lower down than the cerebral cortex, the structures in the brainstem and even the spinal cord and many structures that are really in peripheral nerves that go into every nook and cranny of our bodies and bring information into the nervous system. Uh, whereas the, the, the sort of big mind, the, the, the great picture of the world that we construct with our higher senses, such as vision or hearing or, 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 or smell or touch, those uh, uh, are actually somewhat more, uh, uh, somewhat more robust uh, when you when you have damage in lower structures. So I want to keep going down. So I'm going to keep going down. We started <laughs> up in the, the parietal regions, and we're going down through the affect complex. And I, I was surprised. Well, I wasn't surprised. I was intrigued that the periaqueductal gray was sort of in the center of so much of that affect complex. Mm -hmm. And for me, the 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 PAG is kind of a mystery. But but the question I have is. A lot of what comes into that brainstem region through the the efferents, the afferents rather, of the vagal nerve, and through processing of the 
sympathetic nervous system comes into those brainstem nuclei and do we really know what they're doing is my question. Because I, I was surprised there wasn't more about the autonomic nervous system. Well, there are two things that surprised me. Because because I, I let, let me just, let me. I'm, these are hard questions to ask because these are complicated issues. That all, the affect complex made perfect sense to me. And I saw that as one of the building blocks of consciousness. Made perfect sense to me. But, I, but I've also been thinking that, uh, did you ever see, did you read Bud Craig's book uh, about how we feel about the, or how do you feel about the, insular cortex and the lateral spinal thalamic mm -hmm. tract. Essentially, yeah. he has what, what I was trained was a sensory and a sort of a temperature and pain system. He has it as the core input into the insular cortex through the thalamic, some sort of thalamic mm -hmm. processing as we, how we create the sort of body maps of feeling uh, in the interoceptive maps of feeling. Uh, it didn't, right. didn't seem like I saw that in your reasoning and your, in your model. No. No, and and uh, I think it's very important that you, uh, you know, if we're going to be really serious about this, we have to change that paradigm. Uh, with with all due, due due respect to colleagues that have thought that the cortex was primary, and so what I want for for, for you and for everyone that is uh, watching and listening is that it is actually not the cerebral cortex that is the main provider of the kind of information that allows you to be conscious. And we need to start the story at a much simpler level. And if you don't mind, can I tell you the story my way? Please, to, yeah, to, do it, to, go ahead. Um, so I would I would tell the story the following way. Um, when First of all, when people think about feelings, they very often think about feelings of emotions or, which is worse, they confuse feelings with emotions. Feelings are entirely subjective states. They are experiences that we have, whereas emotions are acting out. They're collections of actions that we can produce. When you are joyful or, or when you are angry or when you are in fear, your face and your body adopt a number of postures, a number of small acts. And it's all something that I like to describe as a concert of actions, which is the reason, by the way, why emotions are directly detectable by others uh, who will know or will presume what is going on in your mind because of the way you act. Okay. By the way, the reason why we classify actors as good or not when we see them in the theater or in the movie, the great actors are the ones that mimic the actions of emotions in such a way that we believe them and we think they are actually having all of those um, states that bring out the joy or the fear or the anger. Feelings, on the other hand, at the core, are purely subjective, purely internal states. They are experiences. And so you will not know if, for example, I am hungry unless I tell you that I'm hungry. Uh, and you will not know if I'm thirsty, nor will you know that I am in pain, except that maybe my pain is so huge that it sort of spills out and you will see that I am, I am uh, all distorted by, uh, by my, my pain. But in general, uh, homeostatic feelings, which are the paradigm for feeling, are things like, such as hunger, thirst, well-being, malaise, um, uh, pain, of course, um, all of those states are internal states. So they are subjective, they're interior. Now, what is very important when you look evolutionarily at what we are and what we have been, is that these states developed in all likelihood very early in the history of life. And they developed and they have a role to play. What do you think is that role? It's information, it's knowledge. That's why my book is called Feeling and Knowing. Feelings, those kinds of feelings bring you knowledge about the state of life in the interior of your organism. Not only that, it's, it's, they, they bring you that knowledge and that knowledge is qualitative. It, it goes in the, the good direction or the bad direction. And then feelings do one other thing that is spectacular is that on the basis of that information, you have the incentive to act on it and do something about it. If you're hungry, you try to get food. If you're thirsty, you drink. 
And if you have pain, you do something about it. And you try to find out what's the cause and you, you know, treat, treat yourself the best way you can. Okay. So why is it that this spectacular development in nature, which is feeling, which gives you the experience, which is internal, and which pushes you, pushes you into action and provides you an incentive to act, why is it that this really works? It works because, to begin with, every feeling is spontaneously and uh, automatically, naturally conscious. And this is something that is sort of quite obvious, quite in front of our eyes, and yet it's completely ignored in discussions about consciousness, which, on the other hand, try to approach the problem of consciousness through the most complicated way. Now, of course, I understand why people do that, and I did that earlier in my career, and that consists of thinking, well, consciousness is so obviously important, we would not be anything if we were not conscious, both in terms of the, the consciousness that I just described. For feelings, we would simply die if we were not conscious, and if we did not have those feelings tell us what to do. But the other thing is that what we see in the world around, what we, what we see, what we hear, uh, the combination of all the spectacular uh, images that we can construct of the world that surround us is so incredibly detailed and rich and so much uh, the, compo the big component of our lives that we take feelings for granted. We forget that they're there. We forget that they exist. And so what I'm trying to say is the following, that without feelings, which are at the beginning of my story, you will not have consciousness. And that feelings are, in fact, in my uh, description, the inaugural event of the long history of consciousness. It's the inauguration of it. It begins there. So when people tell me, well, we will never be able to understand what, what consciousness is, I said, I'm sorry, we have been conscious and lots of creatures before us have been conscious for a very, very long time. And that's for a very good reason, is because they have feelings. And this other great spectacle, this, uh, the, this uh, cinerama uh, with great uh, audio and other features that dominates our minds is in fact misleading if we want to understand what, what consciousness is. Of course, it's not misleading in the sense that it's good to have that world outside and to have that, that world come uh, to us through highly sophisticated components of the nervous system. So for you, I would say to close so that you can ask me more questions, I would say mm -hmm. when you are dealing with the cerebral cortex, you're dealing with the enabler, largely with the enabler of the spectacular multidimensional multi uh, modality world that you get from the outside in and if we did not have a cerebral cortex you could not create those images you could not put them in memory you could not reason you cannot translate them into language which is what i'm doing and you're doing on your side but in reverse so the world of the cerebral cortex is spectacular and important but the world that brings us consciousness to begin with is a world that is much simpler and in fact has existed for a long, long time, in all probability before there were several cortices, and clearly in many, many creatures long before there were humans. So I've so, spoken so, my so let's go no. I get it. And let's let's go down to the paramecium or the organ or the bacterium, the yeah. single cell well, organisms, bacteria. which yeah. are which be behave as though they have feelings, as though they have motivation, but they're but they don't really, they're just following chemical pathways you, or reacting to, you know. Yeah, so you is there a it. threshold? Is there a threshold there is, though that for consciousness where we start to talk about it meaningfully? Yeah, well, the, it, you, you just you just did the, the, the key, you use the key words which, which behave as if. That's exactly it. So organisms that are fairly simple uh, and that are alive clearly they have a metabolism they need energy they do lots of things like choosing the right part of the environment but whenever i when i said the word choosing i should have put uh, quotes around that word and i can't uh, when i speak but what happens is that they behave as if 
they were conscious, they behave as if they knew what they were doing. As it turns out, they don't. As it turns out, they are intelligent, but their intelligence is covert. Their intelligence is not, we can call it implicit, covert, non-manifest, because they don't have the power in their organisms to represent what's outside or what's inside. They are able to do it by a very intriguing mechanism, which, by the way, is, is partially elucidated, but not fully, and they, they do not have the capacity to represent what's going on. By the way, plants are exactly in the same position. So the same way that you have bacteria behaving that way, you also have plants which are obviously alive, which have uh, needs, for example, they bring nutrients from and from the soil through a root system, uh, and they sort of uh, grow up and uh, look at the sun. Uh, and yet, those organisms also do not have feelings in the proper sense, and they do not have consciousness. And what's happening there is, again, an implicit covert intelligence that allows them to behave very intelligently, but they do not have a nervous system. And here uh, comes the, the, the critical issue, is that in order to create feelings, in order to create any other kind of representation, you need nervous systems to give you the possibility of generating maps, generating patterns, and it's out of those patterns that you're going to have the possibility of, of generating images if you're thinking about the outside world. And in relation to feelings, you do it through a combination. To, it's, it's very interesting what I propose in my current thinking and in that book. What I propose is a marriage of really body and nervous system. So I'm not saying we get feelings out of the nervous system. In fact, that's one of the things that I'm trying to fight against, is this idea that if you know the brain, if you're a neuroscientist or a neurologist, you're going to have the chance of explaining everything, including consciousness. That's going down a garden path that will not lead to a solution, because feeling is born out of this interaction between what belongs to the nervous system and what belongs to the body. There is an intermingling of the two. And if you want, I can even tell you why that intermingling is possible because of the very particular nature of the nervous system when it is confronted with the body. Sorry to go so long. Which is that, is no, which is that it, it uh, the parts of it don't have a blood brain barrier and there's all sorts of overlap and interactions that See, are not you are, you strictly are wiring. Involved. You're fully informed. I should be interviewing you. Um, so <laughs> the, well, I, I, the, go ahead. No, the, it's, it's, it's true. You just touched on some very important aspects. So, for example, if you look at the, 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 the way our visual system operates, uh, first of all, it's very late. The visual system was the, 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 the late arrival in all the systems that bring the world on to us. But you look at that system, it's really extraordinary. You know, whether you look at the retina or the optic nerve or the visual cortices, what you find is the most modern, quote unquote, neurons that you can find in, in nature. Uh, you find these, these cables that are perfectly insulated with myelin and that bring signals in without any loss of signal, which is spectacular. And... Uh, it really is a very sophisticated apparatus. And you can see, looking at it, that nature has taken many, many millions of years to arrive at that huge complexity and perfection. And much the same could apply to the auditory system or, 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 or to touch and so forth. When you look at the nervous system that participates in the making of feeling, we find exactly the opposite story. So first of all, it's the oldest of all systems. No, no question. We, we're here we're not talking about hypotheses. We're talking about certainties. It is the oldest of the systems. And then it shows the age by, by its architecture. You know, it's, it's, like a, it's like a poorly built house, um, but a poorly built house is very convenient 
and that nature has kept that way because it's convenient and because it delivers the goods. And what you find is that there's no myelin in the in the uh, axons. Uh, you find which allows, for example, the the, the 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 neurons to respond to chemicals that are around it. And then you find something quite extraordinary that I I mention in the book, and you you just mentioned. The, the blood-brain barrier. So, for example, when you look at our cerebrum, our brain, uh, the cortex is protected by a, a, a set of membranes that form what we call the blood-brain barrier. And it's there to av avoid that the ups and downs of a variety of chemical molecules that is part of our day uh, with digestion, different hours, what we work, our excitements, uh, and so forth, our efforts, uh, sleep, and so forth. All of that is being very well protected by the presence of this blood-brain barrier that eliminates an interaction between the, uh, the neurons that are there in the nervous system and all this bath of chemistry that is around the nervous system. Lo and behold, when you go to the ganglia that bring information from the body into the spinal cord or into the brain stem, what you find is huge gaps of the blood-brain barrier, which means once again that there is a possibility for the body, meaning the chemical molecules on the side of the body, uh, commingling with the structures of the nervous system who are there sort of able to receive them and interact. And once again, my idea that this is an intermingling, it's a, 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 a cooperation of two components that yields something new and was something new in evolution when it first appeared, which is feeling, this, this ability to experience what is going on. And, and I think you mentioned also, of course, the pituitary is part of the central nervous system is intimately involved in the blood, right. it, <laughs> let's it, say, and it, interacting it, with, it, go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the, the entire thing, what, what is so important here is to see that uh, this was a beginning of a story that, um, of course, it's not simple in any way, but it is simpler that what many people have tried to imagine it would be like. So people uh, have uh, and the, the tendency, which I did when I, when I began studying this, these problems, and saying, well, your consciousness is so important that it has to be associated with the most refined parts of our nervous system. Lo and behold, it's not that way, as far as I can see. It's the opposite of that. It starts with the simpler parts. Now, of course, the simpler parts of our nervous system are anything but simple. They're extremely complicated. Obviously, I, I don't need to insist on that. But, but it, it yields something different. And the other thing that is so interesting is that the possibility that we have of understanding uh, or, and, and being conscious of, for example, for example, I'm conscious right now of being I'm looking at a screen where unfortunately I see myself. I don't see you completely, uh, which I could, but I don't see you completely. And all of this is uh, extremely complex and rich um, and is done in a very different way from the simpler parts of feeling. And yet, none of this would make any sense to me if I could not connect the images that I'm seeing or the images that I have of my study right now, uh, connect those images with that core of feeling that is allowing you to be conscious. It's, it's that, that marriage of every image that you can have to the core of feeling which constitutes your core self. That is what allows you to be conscious. So it, it, in, in a way, complicated as it is, the problem, I think, is solvable. Now, of course, I could be entirely wrong, which I doubt I am, but uh, uh, time huh. will tell. Well, let me, I want to zero in on consciousness in a second, but before we do, I, is it oversimplification to say the way we evolved is this, it's from a neurobiological standpoint is not by 
evolving um, old systems into new, but piling new systems upon old. Is that an oversimplification? Not at all. Not at all. I think you said okay. it and you said it beautifully. And that's an extremely important idea. Uh, it, it, we, we, we create these novelties. You know, it, it, quite amazing to think we could go back to the time of the first feelings. And the time of the first feelings, I imagine, was actually with very simple nervous system, nervous systems that were literally just beginning to do its thing. But you know what, what it produced? Something extraordinary. From the moment you had feelings, suddenly you had knowledge being brought into the system, factual knowledge, because if you have pain, that's factual knowledge. And the nervous system was allowed to respond to that knowledge. Prior to that, it couldn't. You had to know that in order to respond in a more intelligent way. And being hungry or being thirsty or having pain or being well, by the way, all of those are informative. Being well gives you license to do other things rather than curating your body. And so if you're well, you can have a good time and you can worry about uh, procreation and other such things. So uh, the, the, this is informative, and that knowledge yeah. carries an enormous weight because it allows creatures to start responding not just automatically with that kind of bacterial intelligence that we mentioned, that implicit uh, covert stuff. Now you're going to start responding with some knowledge, with some assertion that comes from you being aware of you. You know, it, it, it really yeah. is the bringing of the self at its very, very uh, timid uh, beginnings. In, in an embedded world, it's, it's a self embedded in, in a world, which is kind of interesting. And I, my bet is the endocrine piece was linked deeply to this evolution, because I'm imagining catecholamines and fear, you know, the hunger enzymes and, and eating, and just how the you know, the priorities of life, it's eating and getting away <laughs> and then reproducing. Exactly. You, you just got it. You're, you're per perfectly correct. And uh, make no mistake, you just said something extremely important is that these things probably began mostly at the chemical level. So there were yeah. things that were yeah. being done by our organism or with our organisms that were being done by chemical molecules. It didn't start with yeah. actions from striated muscles pushing people around or embracing people. Um, it, this starts at a modest chemical level, uh, except that the word modest probably does not apply, uh, except in comparison with what we do now with our, with our reason and creativity. Uh, it was modest only by comparison because it was already extremely complex. Is it appropriate to call feelings cognitions? Ah, uh, you see, that, that's a beautiful question. It's very interesting. Nobody has ever asked me that. Uh, and I like that question very much because to me, feelings uh, produce cognition. Feelings are an early part of the story of cognition because feelings bring you knowledge. So I, and that's again why it's, I call it feeling and knowing. Uh, um, but of course, when you think about knowing, what occurs to immediately is the idea of cognition, of cognition is about knowing. So uh, the answer should be, I think, yes, feelings bring on a kind of cognition. Although in the way our disciplines have evolved academically, for example, and in, the, in the, all of the research enterprise, people have always tried to make a separation between effect and cognition. And of course, mm -hmm. when you talk about effect, the words that occur to you immediately, the concepts are feeling and emotion. Um, so uh, there you, 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 ha you have more of a separation because people who call themselves cognitive scientists, there's no reason why they should not study feelings, but many of them don't. And there are people that call, for example, in discussions on this matter, uh, it's common to say, well, uh, so-and-so is too cognitivist. Uh, and that simply means that that person is not paying uh, due 
attention to things that have to do with affect, which mean feeling. So cognition and feeling are from an artificial uh, division of labor, in especially in the academic world and in philosophical yeah. traditions, they are separate. It's, but in the end, they, they're not. It, yeah. The historical anachronism, both uh, about you know epistemology, metaphysics, and then the way psychoanalysis evolved, and then cognitive disciplines just grew, you know, separate from whatever that was. Interesting. Uh, and also, I, I noticed you uh, seem to assiduously avoid mood. <laughs> Am I, is um, that true, or did I miss it? No, 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 no. Yeah, certainly not assiduously. Uh, no, it, it's just that the um, you know. Um, by the way, how, how, how should I how should I address you? Drew, should, should I address you? yeah, Drew, Drew. Just, just that. No, Drew. Okay, Drew's good. Um, just like that. Okay, just like that. Uh, so the uh, you know I think that one is trying when one is trying to explain things that are as complicated as consciousness and feeling, uh, the more words you bring into the mix the less clear you're going to be so it's not that i'm uh, that i'm uh, ignoring moods of course well, well that's a very interesting concept and it describes important things uh, like for example most of my my day i have been in almost a bad mood uh, and uh, and by the end i was even in a worse mood because i was desperate <laughs> about a connection so when you tell me right. That I'm seriously avoiding moods. Uh, I, I can tell you two answers. Yes, I don't want more moods like today's. <laughs> um, but no, I'm not. I'm not uh, avoiding that. There are plenty okay. of words. You just, they're just keeping it clearer. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it as clear. It's interesting. As you know, it's funny. I, 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 it's jumped out at me because I, I started thinking about how Heidegger, th you know, epistem uh, phenomen phenomenologically thought about moods as things that are part of the environment that we, again, it's something that happens to us because the environment, like the room has a mood and we're affected by it. That was his mm -hmm. construct. But I got to take a quick break here. And when we get Please. back, uh, what I want to do is get in and let's start, let's get into consciousness. Let's define consciousness and really get into specifics. Okay? Very good. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy. Or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. Here with my daughter Paulina to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. 
it's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right, no kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st. So, uh, yes, of course, Doesn't That Be Awkward is out. The other book we're talking about is Feeling and Knowing with Dr. Antonio Damasio. And let's jump right back into it with the topic of consciousness. Shall we try to define it? Uh, and and I'll, I'll get later into whether it's a hard problem or not. <laughs> Very good. So consciousness is what allows us, putting it in as simple a way as possible, what allows us to experience obviously from the inside, uh, the state of our life, to experience the fact that we are alive in our bodies and to connect that experience with the kinds of things that we see or hear or touch or smell or taste around us. So it, it, it really, the, 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 the critical words are experience, uh, subjectivity, because it's, it's, from the subject that there is a subject that is doing this um and the fact that there is a valence to it there is a quality so what, whatever it is that we are conscious of we have uh in most circumstances a sense of whether that is agreeable or disagreeable at some point in the, in those two extremes so I'm now having this conversation and I have all sorts of reasons why uh, intellectually this is an agreeable conversation and I like it and I like the idea that I'm having this conversation uh, for several reasons. At the same time, my consciousness of it also has this element that is negative because we had a problem with our connection and we had to the delay your program so it it, it was it, 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 there's that mixture but that mixture is what life is more often than not about life is not just unpleasant or pleasant there's a constant modulation that is happening at any moment and consciousness is what allows us to be uh, experiencing our life with all of that effect component that is so important I, I want to try to differentiate self from consciousness or how self figures into consciousness. And, and as you were speaking, I started think, it, but I started thinking that, you know, the William James's I am and the William James me sort mm -hmm. of break down into your consciousness versus self categories, right? The, isn't this the conscious subjectivity is the I am and the yeah. me is the self. A, a, a little bit, yeah. I, I think the, 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 the self actually is probably the most difficult to define of these terms. I mean, the idea of consciousness, the idea of an experience and an experience that feels like something, I think is, uh, you know, it's, it's not exactly easy, but it's something that you can, you can conceptualize, you, you can get around that. When you think about self, is that, what is that? Is it the notion of your body in its entirety? Uh, is it a notion of a sort of me, an I inside? That is much more tricky to, to define. And in fact, there are all of these different kinds of self, depends on the gradation. The, the important thing is that the most important of the selves is the basic one, is the one that uh, provides 
the authentication of whose body you're in. Um, just mm. that is for, for you and for your viewers, just think about this. Is it mm. ever the case okay. that when you feel hungry, you ask the question, could it be that it's not me that feels hungry, that is somebody else? Does this hunger belong to me? You never ask that question for a very good reason, is that the feeling of hunger is so interwoven with the sort of core representation of who you are as a human being, as a body, a life, that you automatically know that it's you having the hunger or the thirst or the desire for whatever, um, and you're not going to have any hesitation. Now, what is interesting is that there are the selves that are more complex, more intellectually uh, complex. So, for example, if you um, ask me something about my life as a, a citizen or my life as a uh, academic, uh, my, my, my life as a scientist, the self that I have as a scientist is much more complicated because there are elements that are the core self, which has to do with our with our lives and how they're being lived moment by moment. And then there are other aspects which have to do with a lot of cognitive stuff that has to do with our professions, our societies, uh, how we go about doing the work, uh, the comparison, for example, between doing science now or doing science at the time of William James. Uh, all of that is a, a still about a self, but is much more complex. And that one is very richly mental. Uh, in the quote unquote term, because it's full of all these uh, these uh, bits of knowledge that you procure from different um, cerebral cortices and you put together in this great image of what it is a human being living now uh, in 2021 uh, after a pandemic uh, or in a pandemic. Um, so it, it, it's the, the, the self is complicated if you bring in all of that story. But if you stay with the core self, then I, I find it relatively easy to define and to defend. It's what allows you to be certain that what's happening to you is happening to you and not to somebody else. That, that, that authentication, that certification that your feelings are in your body, in your life, and not in somebody else's. You had once defined it as repeatedly reconstructed neurobiological processes that endow experience with subjectivity. Yes, that's very beautiful. That that's old Damasio. <laughs> I, I loved it too. That's why I always remember it. But I still think it's yeah. relevant in this. In this, no, uh, I, I, think, it, I still think it's it, because 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 I, I want to. You you mentioned valence and qua feeling like something which is really the 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 concept of qualia right yeah, and and exactly. so there the famous quality is the famous quality is what does it feel like to be a bat but isn't right. consciousness about somebody's having that feeling that we have this old second order thing that humans experience that there's an awareness of an awareness or some there an awareness that somebody not just some bat but somebody antonio somebody drew is having these yeah. experiences yeah, right, and 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 you have that. That it gets into a very interesting um, diversion, which is not only do we know about ourselves, and that's the great gift of uh, feeling and core self, um, but we also can imagine the states of others, which we can imagine from a variety of clues, and then we can sort of put ourselves in the state of others by drawing on this big process of empathy, uh, which, which is a very curious thing in which some of us can get and others apparently can't. There are plenty of people mm -hmm. that are not mm -hmm. very empathic mm -hmm. and, and don't, 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 cannot imagine what it is like to be suffering or in pain so that they cannot imagine that somebody can be, uh, can be happy either. Uh, and, and that we can do, and it's, it's part of our humanity. So not only do we have access to our own states, but then because we do, and because now, now we come back to where we began, Drew, which is that very complicated cortex that allows us to have memories 
of many things, including states of feeling, and then create a connection and create a, a way of describing this. And, and so if I empathize with somebody who is in pain because the person was just, was just in an accident, I'm going to feel a little bit of the person's pain if I'm a really empathic person. And, and, and that will make me, I, I will not have the same, the same suffering exactly, but I, I will have a, a, a little bit of it so that I can truly connect with that other human being that is suffering through something that I have suffered before in different circumstances. And that's a very good guide to my actions. Now, again, think of the fact that here we have a kind of feeling, in this case, a feeling that is extremely high level and complex, which is putting myself on the shoes of somebody else, which I can do naturally. And that is guiding my actions. I, I, it was interesting, I just caught myself saying these words because this is a repetition of the theme that I gave you earlier in our conversation when I said, this is feelings are actions, uh, I'm sorry, feelings are experiences that guide our actions. It's that knowledge that points us, gives us an incentive to go in a certain way. So if you see somebody that just fell on the street and uh, is hurting probably from a broken leg, the thing that we do automatically is to empathize with that situation and realize that we could be in that sit situation and then do something about helping the person. So again, it's, you know, you're, you're not helping the person because in school, somebody told you when people fall on the street, you're supposed to go and help them. Well, I mean, I hope somebody told us that in school. I don't remember that they did, but that's not the way we do it. We do it because something inside of us through the feeling system is telling us to do it and it becomes inevitable. Mm. So that's the beauty of empathy for you. And, and you can see how the evolutionary advantages, you know, of, of the exactly. human being, which is otherwise relatively defenseless in terms exactly. of the survival exactly. of the species. So um, it, it's so I, interesting. I, I, yeah. I was going, going, going to say back so to the higher cool. cortical. Go ahead. Please. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that, that it's, evolution is, is helping us both ways. So in this particular example of empathy, it's helping us because it's doing something good for us, because by doing that good action, you actually did something that satisfied uh, inner needs, if you are a well-structured uh, human being. But it also helps another human being. So it, it's interesting how uh, in, in, our, in our history, at a certain point when you have develop, cultural developments, those cultural developments are largely modeled on what individuals are like. Uh, it's not a, an invention from scratch. And because of that, we can be both good to others and good to ourselves. I, I just wanted to just quickly harken back to the, the higher cortical functions that, that yeah, you please. mentioned, which was that um, I was, uh, I kept thinking in, in the book when you were talking about those functions about how unfortunately, you know, if you're not a physician, you never get exposed to waking comas. And you can see people who have all kinds of cortical dysfunction, but are in, are in a coma, but are wide awake. And so cause yeah. it would help people understand that, that consciousness is just not, is not just about alertness and awakeness. There, there are many exactly. levels to it, to uh, consciousness. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you, you have all, so, all this very, we have this very complicated, um, you know, it's, it pays to, to go and look at the kinds of situations in which consciousness can be obliterated. And it is obliterated when, when, when of course, feeling is highly compromised. And that happens in, in, in strange situations. The, the, the coma, for example, as you mentioned, and of course, the very close connection between that and the brainstem, which we mentioned earlier. And then you also have, we didn't talk about anesthesia, did we? Not yet. Uh, anesthesia. No, I was going to mention it when you brought when you brought when you brought up the plants. I was going to bring it in there. Yeah. But go ahead. 
Yeah, so anesthesia is also a very interesting situation in which uh, consciousness can be lost. Uh, now, um, Drew, let me tell you a story about anesthesia, which I, I like to tell people. I, I've, I've been through lectures on anesthesia in which people talked um, with great detail and with good facts about the fact that, well, in anesthesia, you're not going to see things, you're not going to hear things, all of that goes. And then I, I want to ask this, why is it that we want to have anesthesia in the first place? Why is it that we want to lose consciousness thanks to an anesthetic? And the answer is very obvious. We want to lose consciousness because we don't want to feel the knife of a surgeon, right. correct? So right. uh, then, yeah. it, we don't want to Interfere. Pay. And, exactly. And, and so it's very interesting because uh, in the conversation about anesthesia being a way of losing, once again, the external world, uh, people forget that what they're losing foremost and what they want to lose for sure is the feeling of pain and suffering and fear and the, 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 the all the disquiet uh, because that's exactly what the surgeon is going to do to you. He's going to cut your flesh. So it's, it's quite interesting how uh, some of these things have actually been looking at us in, in, in the eyes, but we tend not to see because you look at other parts of the discussion and the discussion on consciousness is so often loaded towards the outside world and avoiding the inside world as if it were not, you know, it's really taken for granted. It's taken for granted and not given the due that it, it needs to, to have. And when you think about right. anesthesia, it was caused, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Or not, that would just say we don't make it explicit. We don't make it, we don't think about it. We don't think about it. Yeah, and and uh, we pay no attention to it. But but so interesting also because anesthetics, of course, there are a huge variety of anesthetics, but they they actually are. Uh, I like to say that they're rather blunt instruments. So anesthetics mm -hmm. do not actually obliterate consciousness primarily. And one way in which you know this is actually the rapidity with which they act. I'm sure you've had anesthesia for something uh, in, in your life, yep. haven't you? Right. Yes. And so what oh, happens? Yeah. A couple you times. I, I, do, I do poorly with it. I just, I'm wiped out for three months afterwards. Well, but, but what is interesting is that there you are, and the anesthesiologist uh, asks you, for example, to count, and you start counting, and at the count of two or three, you're gone. And it's, it's a switch. Something was turned off. Well, what is turned off actually is not consciousness. What is turned off is a variety of processes that undergird consciousness, such as sensing and detecting. So do you know that, and actually you know because you, you, you read the book, plants can be anesthetized. And what that happens, since they don't have feelings, since they don't have nervous system, obviously they're not going to be in a coma and they're not going to be in a state of loss of consciousness. They don't have it to lose. What they do, though, is that they become like frozen. You know, it's like a frozen image. And nothing much is going on in their metabolism. Uh, and uh, and if, if they have, for example, if roots can grow, which is one way in which plants have movement, growth of roots, uh, then roots stop growing. The, 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 everything is in suspension. Uh, so it, it, it's interesting. And this can also happen at the level of bacteria. So it's not to say that anesthetics um, compromise our consciousness is true in general terms, because they do, obviously, as a, a sort of later consequence. But what they do is hit at something much more basic that compromises everything and compromises everything so extensively right. that lo and behold you you also lose consciousness Free, freezing a little a little closer yeah. to it exactly exactly uh, that, yeah that's interesting that's i never thought about it that way i yeah. i heard you in a and before you've been very you've been very um, um generous with your time so i'm going to let you go in just a second but before i do i heard you on a another podcast i like very much called brain science uh with ginger i forget ginger's last name uh, uh, she's a neurologist, I think. Um, and I 
detected, this is a totally different topic very quickly. Uh, a, a certain amount of, I don't know if it's a dissatisfaction or concern or it might've been the stronger feeling, speaking of feelings that I was <laughs> detecting as it pertains to our, as it pertains to our profession. And it, in that conversation, you were specifically telling her that, you know, if you wanted to research, get a PhD, don't, don't bother with this thing we call being a doctor. It used to be, it used to have a, you, you use the word gentlemanly or something to describe what it used to be. Like it's, it's lost something. And I thought, boy, you're right. I, I just wonder what, what Ginger Campbell, that was her name. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I was wondering what it was that you were really thinking. Uh, you, you see, um, I, I almost picked up, I'd, I would say even a little disgust maybe. No, no, no. Well, uh, I, I don't think I, I share that. I tell you what I think. Uh, first of all, I think that the, 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 the medical profession is, uh, noble and beautiful, and uh, it, it is something that uh, I, I, I admire uh, tremendously. It's just that the medical profession is not the best means to arrive at uh, scientific results today. Um, but I can I can be equally critical of uh, having people that have no idea of what uh, uh, an entire human organism is like and are doing research on topics that they have not seen, uh, they have not experienced firsthand. So I, I no, I, I, I think it, it was probably a, 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 a miss, um, a, 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 I must have said something that made you think that, but no, I, I, what I think is that these professions, these activities, have a very high degree of specialization. So if you are going to be a good neurologist today, uh, you know, I, I would not be practicing neurology today. Uh, I, and I'm not practicing neurology, and I decided not to do it uh, because not only that I had other things to study that I uh, needed time for, but because I decided that you had to make a choice and you either do one thing or the other if you want to do it well. But likewise, if you want to be a, a scientist and you want to talk about things that are intimately human uh, and that have to do with, with medicine and you have never had the experience of having the responsibility for a sick human being in your hands, uh, then I don't like that either. So I, I'm, I think I'm a very, uh, I'm, I'm a fair player here. I, I think that they're to, to, to each his own. You, you, you have, I think in the best of circumstances, you do science or you do medicine and you have an opportunity of being great at either. Now, granted, there are people that manage to do both and I managed to do both for a long time and I, th I thought I was good at it. Um, but I think the times were different and the responsibilities were different. And what we know now is much more on both sides. Not only is the science more complicated, but the medicine is more complicated too. So you, you, you yeah. have a growth in complication yeah. at a certain point. Uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't like to, to, be, to be on an aircraft uh, with a pilot that said, you know, by the way, part of my day I, <laughs> I spend doing whatever else. And I don't train yeah. regularly, and I, you know, you you want you want that that regular exposure. Wouldn't you agree with this? Okay, so, so yeah, I do agree with that, and and I and I it must have been something in my internal homeostatic feeling state that I was uh, mobilized or motivated from something you said that was not uh, something that there I was properly go. empathically attuned to. Uh, but but I thought you were complaining about our profession a little bit, but maybe not. So. <laughs> Um, well, listen, uh, you have been very generous. I love the book, Feeling and Knowing. Please do get it. It's worth your time. I, I, I cannot stress enough. But if, if somebody were to read your opus, your, your, well, to get a feeling for your current understanding of um, the psychology and philosophy of the human experience as you know it, would it be Descartes' Error and this book? Or would it, what books would you read of Antonio Damasio's to get a a sense of the landscape as you know it. I think that there's a the book that I wrote before this one. Uh, it's called The Strange Order of Things, which I don't think you mentioned. And actually, I've not read it. Out, I didn't even know about it. Uh, 
There you go. Oh, 2018, I think. Same publisher, Pantheon, uh, and same editor. Uh, and uh, and that book, I think, was um, was was the beginning. I mean, it coincided with my orientation in the direction that I have now. So uh, I, I think that's that, that's the one that would expand on on this one. And uh, and then what you should do is get the next one, which I I promise I will oh. write. All right, fantastic. <laughs> no, I look forward to that. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the uh, other of books that I have contributed uh, uh, something, but but they're, they're older. Uh, Descartes remains uh, uh, the book that brought together uh, effect and reason in a very close yeah. way, and so that's. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah. strange order of things. I, I still uh, think seems- I, I still I still think of Descartes' error as, as kind of a primer to get people going, uh, and then. Yeah. Strange order of things, up. feeling and knowing. And uh, Dr. Masio, is there? Do you want people to go anywhere else? A website or a, a Twitter? Any place else we can find you? Oh, you, I, I know you can find me through my books, through the, the okay. papers I publish. Um, uh, right. I, I think the, the, the website of of my publisher will have plenty of information about um, about this book. And I think that uh, uh, Twitter will also have it. Yeah. But thank you very much okay. for having such interesting questions. You ask very complicated questions, and uh, um, but I, I hope I, I, I hope I I was able to to answer a few. They they were great, and I I feel like I'm I'm standing at the oracle when I'm asking these questions. I love the oh, books, good. and uh, I please keep writing, and uh, I, can't, I can't get enough of them. Uh, and uh, okay. Dr. Masio also has a Twitter handle at Damasio USC. Dr. Masio, thank you for spending time with us. My great pleasure. Thank you very much for asking good questions and uh, uh, sorry for the delays I caused. Oh, don't don't worry. And uh, we'll say farewell to Dr. Damasio. And then Caleb, I'm going to hang back a little bit and uh, talk to the the uh, the um, clubhouse people and the restream people who have been uh, buzzing away here. Uh, I'm sort of trying to keep an eye on you guys. Uh, it seems like there was lots of questions uh, in, in many areas that were not related to the material Dr. Damasio and I were talking about. So I thought I might try to uh, get a couple of questions off Clubhouse very quickly. Uh, Leopold, how are you doing? Hey. How are you? Uh, well, doing okay. Day one of my trials over. Still got a couple more to go, but uh, fascinating uh, guest that you had on them. He's the best. And I know that, yeah, amazing, just amazing. And, you know, I, I did a little work uh, at UC Irvine in, in the psychobiology department and uh, wanted to ask a couple of thoughts. And I think also in vocals, I, I might have post, posted a couple of articles regarding, you know, your thoughts perhaps on the, uh, you know, the quantum effects. Of, oh, I uh, saw you talking about that. I saw I saw you on recently yeah. putting that out there. And, and that that was so far from what we were talking about. I thought I better not. It, it, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, yeah. I, I saw that, uh, and I thought, wow, that's a great question. So ask it now. I don't, I don't have an answer, but ask it so yeah. people can think about it out there. Well, well, yeah. I mean, it, it's just it, it's interesting. I mean, so you know, the idea of you know what happens. And, you know, you brought up anesthetics, and you know, do you actually know the actual mechanism of anesthesia? We don't. And, and we don't, right. right. And I know that there's um, some thought out there that what can happen is, you know, that there might be a quantum element of consciousness. In other words, that you know, you would shift um, perhaps, you know, the electron shifts and such that happen in quantum, right. in, uh, quantum it, it, dynamics. Right. Does it, does it, yeah. does, well, there's so many layers to that question. One is, is, is there, is there a, monad of consciousness the way leibniz would say it right so are is yeah. everything have monads of consciousness in it or is there a quantum explanation around consciousness and it yes. gets, and it gets and, very weird when you start yes. going towards the newer quantum theories about there really not being many different electrons but we're all just one electron 
Now, and, that's not and, likely, but that's one. That's where quantum goes, and then it gets and, very weird. And you know, additionally, Doctor Drew, you know, so my fiance and I, uh, I say that we're connected. Yeah, and I mean, Doctor Drew, I'm talking about weird stuff. Yeah, I listen. I listen. We'll talk to Susan about that. That she spends all her time <laughs> with her friends talking about that stuff. But but we, I, we I listen. Yeah. The, the one thing I know is that we See dead people too. We are emergent properties <laughs> of a giant wave function. Right there, you go. And, right. and thereby, right. much like a computer screen, there may be a source on that that is connected in ways that we just can't. Our little brains I mean, can't figure out. Doctor Drew, if, 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 yeah, and 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 you know, there's a you know, Einstein said it. You know, how does one you know how determine uh, such a complex system with the brain that we have? How do we it, 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 this how uh, that, see that's what when I saw your question, that's where my head went when, when I was thinking. <laughs> We're trying to we're trying to talk about the evolution of this little thing and what it's designed to do, and it, right. it, it's getting because of some quirk of nature, probably that pyramidal layer, that sixth whatever it is layer of our cerebral cortex, we right. start getting into stuff that has nothing to do with our evolutionary purpose. And, but yeah. but but it also we can't really understand it, even though we can describe it and sort of talk about it. Well, yeah, I, and and. and and, and real quickly, yeah. real quickly, you know, last night, uh, I don't know if you saw the 60 Minutes, on, you know, he was talking about him, and uh, they've done a study somewhere, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the U.S., but it was the, uh, it, I think it was the mix, amygdala, yeah. I'm saying it correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and that uh, in empaths, you know, or, or actually heroes that, uh, you know, will be impulsive to help people. Yeah. They have a much bigger amygdala, and then psychopaths have a much smaller yeah. So uh, so amygdala. so the way I think about the amygdala is they, they want to make it a fear center. They, I mean, you'll talk about it in the right. colloquial terms. It's not that. It's it's the valence center. It's it's yeah. a, kind of a relay center. It's the it's the way to think about it is that's the part of your brain that goes that's important, right? right. right. A, and right. if you are able to prioritize other people's experiences you're going to be heroic gonna, uh, i so. see yeah and 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 with the empath so, yeah so very interesting extremely interesting uh, uh we we need more of these types of uh guests i know go back and look at i think you were you might have been sick back when i talked to um uh my other big hero uh alan shore and but there, oh, there, yeah, I, yeah. go look at that one because that's about the you know, personal neurobiology but there's, there's so much good stuff out there i'll try to find some of this stuff uh thanks awesome. leopold appreciate it uh, of course uh and susan are you are you good i know your hamburger's here that's what the dog barking was about yep i'm eating it eating it now okay i i throw a little ayahuasca in there too and oh, you can well, really a, get so, into the consciousness okay. so this is a long story we just got back from costa rica we went down to a place called rhythmia and observed their they're, what they're doing, which is some wild stuff. We're going to do a little TV program about it. I'll let you know when that is available. Uh, a little TV thing about it, you yeah, know? But it yeah, but it was quite yeah, an experience, you know? quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm, we're going to try to maybe interview some of the staff on this thread coming up soon. So I'm going to hold all that until we <clears throat> get more information. From no, people. but like this consciousness, this collective consciousness that was in yeah. there was kind of weird. That was some of what they were talking about. When they got, me. when they got on, the ayahuasca they were all connected somehow is that well and they were also talking about the dissolution of the self which is a whole complex question you know that we were sort of you that's some of what dr demasio was talking about get closer but to my kind of your, that's your some of what demasio was talking about but but um oh crap where, where was i going with this oh uh susan had uh stem cells i did uh, in the course of all this and so I we're going to investigate that a little bit and sort of talk more about that as well i had so, 50 million so anyways whatever we're, you know, we'll talk about we can, when we can we'll talk about and it i'm a new younger woman and a new younger yeah, conscious we'll, we'll version of myself all right we'll see um but uh, <laughs> clubhouse we didn't want to take many calls today because i was going to uh just chat with dr Masia. we appreciate you guys hanging there his voice uh, gonna, was magical. I'm going to end the, uh, I the liked clubhouse it. room right now. Thank you. And uh, for those of you on Restream, we've seen you there. Yeah, ego death, uh, mock disaster. That's what they call that stuff. And, I, and if I had end of life issues, I would want to have that experience. It tends to really help people with their dread of these things. I don't know what's happening to your mic. It's going in and out. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, well, let's wrap this it's up. We appreciate sideways. you all being here. Susan and I. It's yeah. turned sideways. Got to point it to the face. <laughs> Susan and I are uh, 
Uh, <laughs> we are in our time zone two hours ahead here, so we're all screwed up. We, and, uh, yeah. We've been flying all day. I, so I had a quick little nap in uh, there. Caleb, thank you for setting this all up. It's it's always a an honor of mine whenever I get to have contact with Dr. Damasio. So thank you all for yeah, that joining me great. on that. He was and, so funny. He was so upset. He was late. I know. He's very perfectionistic about this stuff. And uh, I was in a bad mood, but I was in a worse mood <laughs> because I was late. All right, Caleb, everything good with the baby? Oh, yes. He's doing great. He's growing. Good. He's and growing. You're going to put a picture up here for us? Of just course give us I a will. Taste. Where is it? He, yeah. There's he my needed baby. to be and held. It, to... You, there we go. That's Look at that. Him. <laughs> Cute. He's uh, sitting there in bed uh, watching The Simpsons with me in the morning. So he looks he like he's watching TV. Pose. I gotta say, <laughs> this will be a new pose. Yeah. Um, and and of Susan, all the dinner parents last are night. like, "Why are you letting him watch The Simpsons at that age?" I'm like, "He doesn't know what's going on. Just let him watch the bright yellow yeah. colors. He just, that's all he cares don't, about don't, right now." <laughs> don't worry. The, he'll he will insist on watching soon enough. Um, that was a mistake I made earlier. It doesn't have to be awkward. <laughs> Uh, right, South exactly. Park, so. uh, yeah. and, and Susan put up a picture on her Instagram last night of our, We speaking of Simpsons, now I'm going to flip into South Park. We thought we saw the man bear pig, but it was actually a <laughs> raccoon bear dog called, called a, what are they called? I don't know. You, do you see the picture she put up? Uh, Caleb, you're laughing. Oh, I saw wait, it. Wait, wait, you I see saw the picture it. Of this it, thing? it looked oh, like yeah. it was a Photoshopped thing. I don't, uh, I don't have it prepped here, but go That's look a over real it. thing. on Susan's Instagram. It's a... It's like a first bandit lady of love. sloth it's a real looking thing. thing. Yeah, yes, I it thought had it was a, sloth when it first a four out. foot tail, yeah. and it had a long snout, like like a, I don't know, it was like a, it looked like a, um, a possum nosed, uh, <laughs> dog, bear, raccoon, bear pig, raccoon. It was crazy, and it's it apparently was, is related to raccoon. And it was I begging have... for food the entire time we were sitting at dinner, and this woman was feeding them next to us. There and... apparently are so many of them in Costa Rica, they just don't even like. Eh. They're, they're huge animals. They're, yeah. And it was just, it was kind of an old one, but it was, it was very interesting. Yeah, kept all us right. entertained. Thank you guys. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we're, I'm going to be traveling again this week, but uh, we'll get back on a normal path towards beginning of next week. Um, back so to I, your mom's house studio. Yeah, I'm going to Austin to visit with Christina. Talk about people's and browns Andy, and whites and and yellows. Little holes in the wherevers and, and so send me your emails and your voice messages there. Uh, Not here. Yeah, I believe it's 1 800 256 253 Don't send those to me. I don't want to know about your D or your P. Send those to your mom's house. Send those to Dr. Drew after dark. All right, guys. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. It was a thrill for me to talk to Dr. Damasio. We appreciate it. I know. You that was great. Me. And uh, we will see you towards the end of the week. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in an immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Man, after these uh, voicemails, you got something that you're going to do for me that I've been trying to get out of you for a long time, but... I'm not going to suck you, Derek. Now that... It's not going to happen.